Mo Hijab says the Jews love life, and the Muslims, they love death. So Mo thinks the Muslims will prevail in strife, because they're glad to breathe their last breath. But what Mo don't know would fill a room. Life will defeat the prevailing gloom. And that's it, ladies and gentlemen. This week in jihad has begun. We are back. We are better than ever. David, I did not, as I was considering last week, go up onto the top of a tall mountain and throw myself off because the inspiration had left me, but I don't think it's back. But uh, nonetheless, I will not imitate Muhammad because I do not think he is the excellent example. And thus... He's kind of a douche. <laughs> what? I'm just saying. <laughs> for for being honest. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's what we should always do. So, yes. Yes, you're quite right and consequently not an excellent example. But too many people still do think he's an excellent example and a lot of them were in Amsterdam this past week. That's the big news. Mm. There was a full-scale anti-Jewish pogrom in Amsterdam, David. I think one of the interesting things about it is that it seems to have been entirely pre-planned and it was pre-planned by a Hamas operative who used to be an official of the, I mean, a teacher at a school run by the United Nations. The uh, Which, which uh, terrorist, uh, to be fair, which terrorist on the planet hasn't worked for the UN, Robert? Well, there you go. Yes. Now we know it's a big terrorism training school and anyway um the i thought one of the most interesting things about it was the massive deception that went around as always does did you hear the stories about how the israeli soccer fans had heard the provoked, jews started it yeah exactly that they attacked a cab driver that they, a muslim cab driver and they were they tore down a Palestinian flag or two, and thus the Muslims, in a righteous rage, they retaliated. You heard you heard this. I heard that. Turns I wasn't out, even follow. I wasn't even following the story, but I heard that repeatedly. But none of it was true, as it turns out, a Muslim cab driver actually joined in the attacks on the Jews, and no Jews, no Israelis actually provoked them with any previous attacks at all hmm. you must be shocked to hear that i'm totally shocked but you know you know robert um, yes david we've seen these things many times before um even in even in small scales uh but it's interesting when when i actually know someone when i actually like like take Hatun for instance she was attacked multiple times at speaker's corner uh, one time she was uh, talking about Muhammad and she was hit in the face. Man, struck her right in her face. Had it on video. What did Muslims say afterwards? It was a Christian who was upset that she I was speaking that. ill of Muhammad. And they mm. spread this around. And you could go to this day when someone brings it up, they'll say, no, it was a Christian. Oh, even yeah. though even the, Mus even the Muslims from Speaker's Corner later confirmed, OK, yeah, that guy's a Muslim. We know who that is. Uh, but once they spread the lie, no, it's a Christian. It just it just keeps going. Right. Mm -hmm. And of course, after she was stabbed, then they started saying, no, that wasn't a Muslim. That wasn't a Muslim. That was someone else who was just mad because she's uh, speaking against God. And so on. it's like they're they're in that community, in the Ummah, there's such a willingness to accept lies. All you have to do is just start the rumor. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, you could you could go slaughter a bunch of Jews in the name of Allah and a Muslim just has to say, oh, that wasn't a Muslim or uh, the Jews asked for it or something like that. And it will spread around the entire globe through that uh, giant ga cosmic game of telephone that <laughs> is the Ummah. You're correct, sir. And there's another big example of that this week, and that is over the arrest of of an array or the charging rather of an Iranian operative who the United States Justice Department says was sent by the Islamic Republic to kill Donald Trump. Now, this is an interesting story in many ways, but one of them that I noticed was that all over the internet the last week, 
there have been people saying, come on, you actually believe that the Iranians were trying to kill Trump when they know what would happen if they really did? This is obviously a false flag that the U.S. Defense Department or the Pentagon or whoever, that they're doing it to try to provoke a war with, or justify going to war with Iran. And it's completely fake. And I thought, well, that could be because trust in the U.S. government is justifiably at an all-time low. And we know that they lie. And so I was absolutely willing to think that uh, this was fake. And it still could turn out to be. But there's a funny thing about it, David. And that is that Iran has recently said that this was exactly what they were going to do. Amir Ali Hajizadeh, who is the head of the aerospace force for the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, he said, Allah willing, we are looking to kill Trump. I don't know how you can spin that to say, oh no, we don't want to kill Trump. It's a false flag. I mean, he says, Allah willing, we are looking to kill Trump. Khamenei, the supreme leader in 2020, he said, the assassin of Soleimani and the one who ordered the murder should be punished. And he says that uh, they will be punished at any time possible. Uh, death to America means death to Trump. So, um, yep. Oh, I just want to point out, as far, as far as them actually carrying out, of course they would want to if they thought they could actually succeed um i don't think trump's gonna well trump's definitely not gonna you know send in soldiers or something like that uh most likely most likely going to uh cost them piles and piles of money though yeah so at the very least uh going to cost them piles and piles and piles of money um probably take away restrictions on israel dealing with iran and so on so um, yeah, this is really, these are really negative consequences for Iran. And it might be a situation where they're looking at the, I mean, almost, almost successful assassination attempt where, I mean, if, you know, if it had been another inch and if it had been another inch closer, it would have, you know, he wouldn't, he would, wouldn't be president right now. Indeed. Um, but, uh, yeah, so I entirely believable yep. and the, and the, and the Iranians aren't, uh, they don't think like other people do, right? Like there is built into, uh, there is built, in, you, you have the you have the leaders and really the only people who support the, the, the regime in power are the extreme radicals, right? The extreme Shia radicals who they really seem like they want to force the Mahdi to come by causing, uh, causing uh, problems in every direction and causing this big global conflict to the point where Islam is going to be crushed if God doesn't intervene by sending the Mahdi. So uh, they they are like the definition of like a doomsday cult type uh, group. And so when they say, so, so when we try to apply our reasoning, oh, Iran, you wouldn't want to do this because that would lead to this. You're assuming they're thinking like you. We don't want problems that we can't handle. Lots of them do want problems that they can't handle because they think that's the signal for Allah to send the backup, the ultimate backup. That's the Shiite prophecy that uh, the Mahdi will return when the Muslims are more persecuted than they've ever been. And so if they get nuked, something like that, hey, that's exactly what they want. And there was actually a, one of the presidents of Iran, one of the former presidents, uh, Rafsanjani, if my memory serves me right, actually said that. We, we could nuke Tel Aviv, Israel would be destroyed. But if they send nukes in retaliation, we can stand 15, 20 million casualties. And obviously then the Mahdi would return, everything would be okay. So this is a, a, indeed a doomsday cult, as you say. And uh, it's hard for Western, especially secular Westerners, who neither have a religion of their own nor study anything about Islam, to understand that. And they just assume that 
the Iranians think exactly the way everybody that they know does. It's really, it's really the biggest downfall of uh, like problems with Western civilization right now is thinking that other people think the same. Matter of fact, this is a, Jordan Peterson just had a discussion with Richard Dawkins, and Dawkins is acting like he doesn't need to defend his moral claims at all. He's just these are these things are obvious. And Peterson Peterson pointed out, he said, uh, it, "It's I think it's great that we've gotten to a point in history where the values." that we hold are so normal to us that you think they're self-evident. He goes, but this is not how human beings just act. It's not, right? And Dawkins is agreeing. He said, "Human, be uh, Jordan Peterson started going, human beings can be brutal. Look at the primates and so on. And Dawkins is, is nodding in agreement. Yes, 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 human beings can be completely brutal and so on. But that idea that we've gotten to, we've gotten to a stage where we take, value, we take certain values and human rights as just obvious and we think we think that it's so self-evident that everyone else agrees with us and everyone all other religions are the same and so on it's just not true and you guys keep hey let's bring in more millions of these people who agree with us on every way why are they killing their daughters and why are they raping our daughter what's going on here they can't they don't they don't they can't comprehend the, the fact that other people do not think the same and that That's is a that is a very dangerous mistake to to make when you're bringing in millions of people it's a it's a very 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 dangerous mistake to make when you have a, a regime like Iran. That's precisely so, David. And uh, this error goes all the way back to George W. Bush. I'm sure it goes back farther. But when uh, George W. Bush made several statements at the beginning of all this, when he was saying that uh, the Iraqi people, they want the same thing. They want the same things we do. They want justice. They want freedom. And uh, we're going to help them get it. And the problem was he was assuming, and they do, they did want justice and freedom, but they didn't define those things remotely the way George W. did. But he never seemed to consider that. That is correct. Anyway, uh, David, we got more uh, jihad, you might be surprised to learn. Um, mm -hmm. And you mentioned actually, you know, why it was kind of a interesting thing. It's as if you almost had my list because you said... We're bringing in all these people who are exactly like us and share our values. And then we wonder, why are they killing their children? And here no, we have it. Um, Lacey, Washington, which is a city, although it could be the name of a person. But in any case, Lacey is apparently a town in Washington State. And a uh, Sounds Muslim... like a strip club. <laughs> yes, Lacey, Washington. That would be in D.C. Um, Isan Ali... And his wife, Zahra Supi Mosin Ali, uh, they have been charged with attempted murder, attempted kidnapping, and assault after being accused of trying to kill their teenage daughter mm. in what the victim described, according to Fox 13 Seattle. And this was unusual because usually they just, the media, as you know, totally lies about these things. But they say the, the uh, daughter... They tried to kill their teen daughter in what the victim described as a possible honor killing. And it seems that the daughter is a student at Timberline High School in Lacey, Washington, and she was attacked by her parents outside the school because they were trying to force her to go to Iraq to marry a much older man. Yep. And she did not want to go. And so we have in this story, this is once again, Fox 13 Seattle, this is not some Islamophobe, says uh, her boyfriend stepped in to try to help during the attack. And nice. I like him already. Yeah, good guy. But uh, it's the parents that are the problem. Uh, police say he was also assaulted and suffered injuries. Disturbing video caught on a cell phone by a witness shows the dad choking her under a tree as other students tried to intervene to save her. Ishan Ali is shown on the video choking his teen daughter with her face shoved in the dirt. And when, uh, when finally the people were around were able to stop this, uh, the victim reported abuse by both her father and her mother prior to the incident, and they had threatened to kill her because she didn't want to go to Iraq to... In, get, to get involved in this marriage. So what is that all about, David? What do we call those things? 
uh, honor killings, That's forced it, marriages man. and forced marriages and honor killings. Um, but I mean, think about all, think about all the layers to this multiple things. One. So, so you had parents there, you had parents there who are raising their daughter in the West, but they want her to be strictly Islamic. So, you know, you're going to go home, go back to your country to find a husband for your daughter. But she she's got a boyfriend. She's in the West. She doesn't want to marry some creepy old heaven's gate pervert like Muhammad, right? She don't want to do that. I don't want to live my life like that. I've absorbed the idea that I have certain rights and certain freedoms. And I, I can actually, I actually have a say in who I marry and so on. Uh, but the parents, the parents, shocker, don't have the same values as, uh, as the surrounding culture. So they actually have a problem. And it's a huge problem. You say, hey, we're going to go, we've set up a marriage between you and this guy. She says, no, that's massive humiliation to them. That shows that you have raised a disobedient daughter, which to them means you have been horrible, awful parents, right? You have not raised an obedient daughter who does what you tell her. She's in, she's in rebellion uh, against Allah, uh, but it's built into the thinking that you have a way of restoring your honor and showing that you are good parents and that it's all on her. And that is by killing her. And lots of uh, lots of the people who try to do this do it in secret or uh, also very because, Robert, how many hundreds of times have we heard this story? There's, there's variations in it, but we've heard this over and over and over again. The variations are um, if she says no, then you trick her into going back to a Muslim country for some other reason. Oh, we're just going on vacation. We're just going to visit Aunt Miriam or something like that. You trick her into going back. And then as soon as she's in the Muslim country, then yeah, I'm sorry, you're not uncle, getting out of here. Uncle Musa. Yeah. Yeah. You're uh, you're not getting once you get her into the country, then you're not leaving. Then, of course, you have the uh, the honor killings and so on. They usually try to do that in secret, make it look like someone else did it or something like that. Uh, but these these guys were uh, uh, based on what you said, doing it just completely out in the open. They want yeah, the he's world choking his daughter outside the high school. Yeah. And uh, hats off, hats off again to the boyfriend and any other students or anyone else who intervene, because we've also seen it's it's a growing trend where people don't intervene in these situations like, um, you know, they're wor they're they're worried about being called. Can you imagine like you'd be worried about being called an Islamophobe? You're jumping on a Muslim who's uh, even if he's uh, trying to murder his daughter, you jump on him. You just got all kinds of people who are so terrified. I mean, keep in, mind, in the UK, they were literally raping drugging pimping gang raping thousands and thousands of 12 and 13 year old girls police would not intervene for the fear for the fear of being called racist or islamophobes here you have students they, they could have had the same reaction i don't we want to get involved in this it's not our what they uh sounds like they jumped in and so on so um uh it's, it's like what what does it take what does it take and the 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 remaining issue here is I hope they're taking this seriously because you remember when Rifka Berry said that her dad threatened to kill her for leaving Islam and becoming a Christian. She was the one who was blasted by the media, by politicians, like across the board. Mm -hmm. And everyone said, well, what are you talking about? This doesn't happen in Islam. This isn't a thing. This is this doting, loving father would never harm his daughter. She's making things up because she wants attention. What an evil little girl. And it, it, you know, the people on our side were basically saying what you're we don't we don't know everything about this situation. It is possible. It is possible that she's making this up or that she's exaggerating. And that's all possible. It's also possible that she's telling the truth. And it's, it's, it's she seems like the kind of girl who's telling the truth about all this. And so if you're going to err, err on the side of caution and do not put her back with her family and everyone tried to put her back with her family, fortunately, fortunately, the state didn't didn't make her go back to her family ultimately, but uh, I don't know. It seems like I mean, are are people at least starting to catch on now that you're not insane if you say there's this thing called honor killings in Islam? Well, I was surprised to see it so matter of factly reported as such uh, in the establishment media by Fox 13, Seattle. That was, I think, a major step. But you're absolutely right. I remember when Rifka was uh, when the case was at its height. 
And Nihad Awad of the Council on American Islamic Relations wrote an op ed somewhere that said, uh, No, little Rifka, there is no death penalty for leaving Islam. And he really? was telling her, Go back home. Your parents love you. They miss you. They're all upset. And yep, yep. Published in a major American newspaper. I forget which one, though. But, uh, and people were too dumb to. It was back in that situation where, oh, look, you've got people like Robert Spencer saying that there's a death penalty for apostasy in Islam. But here a Muslim is saying that's all just made up. Um, what are we who are we going to believe the Islamophobe or the devout Muslim? It never crossed anyone's mind to actually look at the evidence to see Muhammad's mm -hmm. claims, like if anyone leaves his Islamic religion, kill him. And if you want to put it all together into the context of honor killings, uh, Surah 4, verse 65, ladies and gentlemen, says that if you do not submit to everything Muhammad says or all of his decisions, or even if you have the slightest resistance against anything uh, he has decided, you're not a real Muslim. You have no Islamic faith. That makes it very easy and very subjective to accuse almost anyone of being an apostate if they're getting something mm -hmm. wrong. So if a girl is uh, deciding to live uh, a, you know, have a boyfriend and things like that, and she's disobedient to her parent, very easy to say you're actually not a Muslim right now. Uh, you have a, you're an apostate now. What did Muhammad say? If anyone leaves his Islamic religion, kill him. Three of the three of the, there's a disagreement in the in the among the four schools. Three of the four schools of Sunni uh, uh, Islamic jurisprudence say that you kill a female apostate the same way you kill uh, a male apostate. One school says no, you treat uh, a woman differently. It's it's still not it's still not great. They you have them in the the Shias and they advocate actually like punishing the woman. Like some of them say that every day during when she's supposed to be praying, if she's not praying, you lash her. So you, okay, you don't want to, you don't want to be a Muslim. Fine. Every day for the five daily prayers, we're going to lash you uh, until you decide to be a Muslim again. So I believe you can actually torture a, torture that's, a woman. That's a beautiful uh, into, thing, David. It's so, yeah. It's into such believing. a beautiful religion. Yeah, so very easy and very subjective ways to uh, accuse someone of being an apostate. Death penalty for apostasy. Most of the schools say that it applies to women as well. And you have Muhammad's claim in Sunan Ibn Majah that you carry out the Allah's penalties even against your own family members. You put all that together, you have a big justification for exactly what they were trying to do to their daughter. And meanwhile, politicians and journalists were telling us for a very long time there is no such thing we must be insane for reading yeah. words off a page and being able to state what those words are i remember uh being in florida i don't remember if you were there were you there or not do you not remember uh i was in florida at a hearing i think it, i think it was i'm not actually sure i think it must have been because it was outside a courthouse where there was a hearing about the Rifka Barry case. And anyway, uh, big crowd of reporters. And so I went in front of them and started talking to them, quoting Bukhari, quoting apostasy law. And this Muslim guy from the area jumps in front of me and starts saying, he's lying, none of this is true. And there's no death penalty for anybody to exercise his free conscience. And the funny thing about it was that I, I, I got the guy in conversation. I mean, I knew he was lying. He must have known he was lying. And I was looking in his eyes, trying to see, you know, like a lie detector test. Is there, does he have any sign at all? Is there a little smirk? Is there anything that you might see in a Westerner? And it, nothing. He was just 100% completely committed to the lies he was telling. And I thought, this is something that Westerners don't realize because people, I mean, that's how lie detector tests work, right? That if you tell mm -hmm. lies, uh, what is it, your blood pressure jumps or something and, and, mm -hmm. and you get nervous about it. Whereas I think that if you were raised yep. in this kind of environment, mm -hmm. you could pass any lie detector test. You could tell the biggest whoppers and, and not show the slightest reaction whatsoever. Yeah, they say that the uh, uh, people who are best able to defeat lie detectors are compulsive liars, narcissists, and psychopaths because they don't have the same emotional reactions to lying. But I think you could put uh, any of the Dawah guys in there because they actually believe it's good, right? You're not, you're not doing something bad. You're doing something good if you're lying for the sake of Allah. And uh, so the, the final uh, connection in all of that is that was, uh, that was what? 
16 years ago or something like that a long time about, ago yeah about like 16 that. years ago and everyone everyone said we were lying when we talked about the death penalty for apostasy in islam muslim leaders muslim scholars muslim imams uh politicians journalists everyone blasted us here we are 16 years later and robert they're they're proclaim they proclaim from the rooftops now that they're going to kill apostates right i mean yeah. ali dawa says he's going to be eating popcorn watching apostates be killed daniel hakikachu and uh jake bronca or whatever his name is uh he openly admitted on one of the biggest podcasts on the planet talking to you and rashid you guys are both dead you mm -hmm. for um for insulting muhammad and rashid for being an apostate now they admit what and keep in mind what they what are they actually admitting they're admitting that we were right all along and that all the muslims who were saying no no no, that's not a thing we're just flat out lying yeah they're they're acknowledging it they're acknowledging it and after and they so said just, that the guy says so how can we all be friends <laughs> yeah 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 what, what can we do about the uh transgender stuff what would we do about dylan mulvaney it's like whoa they just said they want to kill us what are you <laughs> was, oh yeah that was fun wasn't that insane he really really thought he really thought well i'm gonna i'm gonna build bridges here i'm gonna get christians and muslims together and we're gonna christians and muslims are gonna sit down and they're gonna we're gonna i'm gonna find what they agree on i'm gonna say why can't we unite around that we all sit down and eh, we're gonna kill these guys as soon as we can all right now what can we unite on what <laughs> let's build some bridges dude there are no bridges between us and people who who guarantee that they want us dead well i guess so. when 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 they kill us both then the, the rest of those guys can uh, get together and build bridges. Anyway, uh, we were talking about Muslim families and the mistreatment of uh, one young girl. And this guy, I know you know this guy. <laughs> this is dork. Wissam Sharif. And Wissam Sharif is a Texas-based imam, but this took place in Birmingham, Alabama. And I have to say, those Texas guys uh, really go all going all in on uh, banging little girls. I don't know which which other ones you mean. What other? Oh, Texas I'm talking guys? about. I mean, uh, uh, so uh, Yusuf Estes, he's one of these Texas guys. Um, he said he compares the story of Muhammad and Aisha to Romeo and Juliet. He says it's <laughs> it's, a, it's a it's it's a more beautiful love story than Romeo and Juliet. <laughs> I, I, I didn't know this. <laughs> You've got the Muslim cowboy. You've got the Muslim cowboy who also also he says Aisha was a well, Aisha was a woman through and through. He acknowledges that she was nine. So he's he's not one of these guys who's saying she was eighteen or something like that. He's saying um, you're just you're just a woman at nine. And so it's uh, th these guys really here's here's the problem, Robert. You have these guys, these Muslims, converts even. They're openly proclaiming it's it's perfectly okay for a grown man to have sex with a little girl. You just you just just say she's a woman. We're not ashamed of this. This is whoops, yikes. Well, I think I think David's gone. What do you think, ladies and gentlemen? Um, okay, well, we're hoping he'll come back, but in the meantime, um, gosh, I hope I didn't hit the wrong button. I don't think so, though. Anyway, this is still going? Okay, I guess it is. A little bit discombobulating. Anyway, Texas Imam Wissam Sharif. And he is under investigation for allegedly grooming a woman and her young daughter and producing explicit videos with minors. Char federal charges have been brought against him for conspiracy to produce child pornography. And uh, Sharif has been arrested. He is the founder of a group called Advocating Quranic Literacy and also was the instructor for the Quran Revolution program at Al Maghrib Institute, which has fired and disavowed him. David, welcome back. You there? No idea what happened there. I don't know if I accidentally hit a button or something like that, but it just said reconnect. 
I was wondering the same thing. I was wondering the same thing. And here's Dang, I was I was kind of I was kind of slapping my desk here talking about these guys uh, and their obsession. But the, I mean the the those the creepy thing is. It, it's the same thing with jihad and with the killing of prostates and so on. You have champions of Dawa claiming we're, we can't wait to kill these guys. We cannot wait to. I don't. Maybe you should believe them. Maybe you should think that they're actual real world implications of these guys' views once they get the ability to impose their views. And when you've got these guys saying it's perfectly acceptable to have sex with little girls, maybe you should keep an eye on them and make sure they do not have access to young girls because we keep seeing this over and over again. One would think, but that would be in a world that was sane, and we do not live in such a world, David, because... I'm sorry to tell you this. I, I'm, I'm really sorry to break this to you, David, but there has been an outbreak of Islam. Oh, can you believe that? He just vanishes like maybe the jinns take him. Do you think it's the jinn? Um, I mean, not the kind you drink, but the kind, the uh, enemies of Allah, you know, that are in the Quran, the spirit beings that are the, the mischievous beings Actually, some of them are Muslims in the Quran. Uh, in any case, I was going to tell David about... Here he is. Let's see if we can do this. D. Wood? Yep, that definitely wasn't hitting a button. It's not my internet either. I just tested it. It's going super fast, so it might just be a problem with uh, Ecamm right now. I was uh, raising the possibility that it was gin. It's uh, gin. It's gin or juice. Uh, or ecam <laughs> yes um although the quran doesn't warn about ecam it warns about yeah. gin and juice but i've been i've been cut out twice so it looks like this may keep happening this may be the gin we'll edition see what happens. yeah you're i even see it flickering too. yeah you're i'm flickering, flickering. Huh. Don't this know what is, that is really wild it's pretty wild yeah all these gin in uh in the show tonight, ladies and gentlemen, we have special guests. Anyway, uh, I was bringing up that, that there's been an outbreak of Islamophobia. And the outbreak of Islamophobia was in Massachusetts, right here in the United States, or at least Massachusetts. Did you hear about this? No, but it's a weird place for an outbreak of Islamophobia. It is. It is. It took place in... Uh, let's see if I can find the town here. Um, checking another report. It just says Massachusetts. How very strange. All right. Anyway, okay. McDonald's in Massachusetts. Woman walks in with her hijab on, and she's got her twin seven-year-old sons. And she's got a thick accent. So she orders a plain fish sandwich and she thoughtfully has one of her children repeat the order to the worker in case they do not understand her accent. All right. So mm -hmm. they get their order, which included fries and cookies, and they go over to a nearby school playground to enjoy their lunch. And one of the kids eats the lower half of the bun. I find this a very strange part of the story. I mean, who eats a sandwich like this? Eats the lower half of the bun and part of the fish and notices that there's bacon on the fish sandwich. And so Gadir al is enraged, goes back to the McDonald's, and they say they're very sorry it was a mistake. It looks that they look at their receipt. Their receipt says add bacon. So they get an apology and a refund. But that's not good enough. They're suing for discrimination. And they say now that McDonald's maliciously, because she was wearing hijab, identified her as a Muslim, and decided to put bacon on her fish sandwich just to mess with her out of total mm -hmm. Islamophobia. 
And so mm-hmm. the the Massachusetts Commission Against Discrimination this week found probable cause to go ahead with the case. Good, good, good. Even though McDonald's heatedly denies that there was any discrimination at all. Well, seems like you could have a pretty uh, pretty good defense in a uh, in a civil case there, Robert. Um, ma'am, what did you say when you walked in? I said uh, assalamu alaikum, right? And that sounds an awful lot to like add salami and bacon. <laughs> yeah, and I you also... acknowledge that you you acknowledge that you have a, a huge accent. Hmm. Mm-hmm. And in all seriousness, I think that it's very possible that if they're all upset about bacon that she said to the kid tell them don't put bacon on it and the the you know it's a it's a noisy place and this was during covid this happened so they had a barrier up and mcdonald says it was hard to hear and so they think they're saying add bacon to the sandwich mm-hmm. perfectly innocent mistake and or any anyway, or anything or anything else the kid might have said i have to sure. say i've never heard i've never heard of Bacon usually goes well on most things, but uh, I've never heard of that on a fish sandwich. That's a no, that's not an ordinary thing. And so I suppose that's why they found probable cause that uh, they wouldn't have ordinarily gotten a fish sandwich and had it have bacon on it. So it must be Islamophobia. After all, what else could it possibly be? Yeah, it's not like it. It's not like it could be an, an accident or something. No, certainly not. <laughs> Must be. Everything is deliberate and intentional uh, bigotry and Islamophobia. It has to be. Yeah. Now, see, another thing that makes me wonder about this case is that you got the um, Council on American Islamic Relations involved, and they've gotten, they've had other cases like this very similar in the past, gotten big payouts for the people involved. And of course, then they get a cut because they're supplying the lawyer. And so it seems to me that. Uh, it might just be another case of a kind of a victimhood shakedown where they see vulnerable officials who were worried about their Im- uh, image. You know, McDonald's doesn't want to get a case of Islamophobia and have people boycotting and making a big fuss. So they pay some money to get this to go away. Yeah, normally you settle these things out of court. And yeah, you're willing to you're willing to pay a pile of money in order to avoid the trial and uh, groups like care protesting and stuff like that. You normally just like, okay, here's some money. Yeah. So I suspect that's the situation here, but anyway, we got a lot more jihad. So uh, let's get going in Antwerp. There were more, more attacks on Jews after Amsterdam and uh, six Muslims were actually arrested for planning copycat attacks in Antwerp. But uh, one man who was riding his bicycle was attacked. Another guy, a Jewish, visibly Jewish people, they were attacked in, uh, another guy was attacked in a parking garage. Um, These things obviously did not, uh, these arrests did not stymie the efforts to uh, copy the Amsterdam attack. And in Antwerp, the attackers were uh, saying, Kai bar, Kai bar, ya Yahud. Jaish Muhammad say Yahud. What is that? That's, uh, that's uh, <laughs> the warning the Jews that the army of Muhammad will return. Um, it's a reminder of the Battle of Kaibar, where the Jews were going out to the field to f- farm their crops and so on, and Muslims descended upon the place um, killed the men, um, took the women as their sex slaves, then allowed the Jews for a while to remain in Kaibar and made them dimmies, and they had to pay half of their annual uh, date crop to the Muslims. And then, of course, you had the other issues like Muhammad torturing and killing Kanana and then taking his wife, Safiya, to bed as one of his own wives. You have the story of Zainab bin al-Harith poisoning Muhammad because he was too stupid to know that if you just slaughtered uh, slaughtered a bunch of people and you slaughtered this woman's husband and father and uncle, probably not a good idea to let her be your cook for the evening, but uh, <laughs> she cooked up some delicious mutton for him. He couldn't resist. 
Uh, he was poisoned, died about three to four years later from the poisoning, according to him. And uh, but but it's matter of fact, Robert, AP and I were just talking about this last night. It's very interesting to me because the Muslims still run around. It's I mean, it's interesting for multiple reasons. One, they always have to point to something like a thousand or fourteen hundred years ago as far as them being successful. Right. Like, uh, oh, you're you're asking us about Nobel Prizes. Well, uh, we didn't. We don't have any. But, you know, there was the Islamic Golden Age a thousand years ago. They always have to go back. Like, what have you done for the world lately? Right. Even if we take even if we take you seriously about these things that happened in the past, what could you got anything within the last 800 years, eight <laughs> centuries that you've done for the world or something like that? Um, so anyway, but it's like that. And then when they want to talk about a victory over Jews, they talk about the Battle of Kaibar. You're talking 14 centuries ago, 14 centuries ago. And they're, ha ha, we defeated you 14. OK, we just defeated you like 800 times in a row. Jews just defeated you 800 times in a row and you're running your mouth about something 14 centuries ago. But here's the odd part. They run around bragging about Kaiba. Ha ha, we defeated the Jews when they were going out to crop their to, to their date crop. Ha ha. And we defeated them and took them and raped their women. We're strong and we're going to do that again. We'll do it again. Um, but think about this. What was it? It was like torturing people. They tortured Kenan to find out where he was hiding money, raping the women and so on killing the Jews, it cost them their profit, according to their stories. It cost them their, the price was, it cost them their profit. And they still, they love it. Totally worth it. Yeah, it cost us our profit's life, but totally worth it. Killing Jews is totally worth it. You see the exact same mentality with the October 7th attack. Yes, we killed 1,200 Israelis. Okay, but, and then they, they bombed you down to rubble. But it was totally worth it. It's like the greatest thing in the universe to them is killing Jews and raping Jewish women. And they're willing to sacrifice it. They're willing to sacrifice the entire Ummah. They're willing to sacrifice entire uh, t territories, lands, and so on. They're even willing to give up their profit if they're allowed, if they're just, if they just get to kill a bunch of Jews and rape a bunch of Jewish women. Yep. Weird obsession, weird obsession to have. It's very weird. All right, we got more. David in Italy, we had a train conductor was seriously injured when two young men of North African origin, you know what that means, on a regional train in Genoa, Rivaloro, Riva, Riva uh, they uh, got on without tickets, attacked the conductor. One of them, an Egyptian, used a knife, stabbed the conductor twice. The other one, a, uh, apparently a Libyan, uh, was involved in the assault. And now the uh, interesting aspect of this story is that the railway unions are upset and they're going to go on strike. They're threatening to go on strike if their uh, employees aren't protected. But I don't know if Italy is going to be able to do anything about that because it might be Islamophobic. Yeah, I mean, these countries aren't willing to protect little girls. I don't know why you're going to protect uh, rail, rail, railway workers. Indeed. Good point. In Germany, we had a uh, Christmas market. It's that time of year again, David. We had a planned jihad massacre at a Christmas market in Schleswig-Holstein. That was the Amsterdam. same thing. That was like five years ago. There was It was an attack on a Christmas market in Germany. In Schleswig-Holstein? I don't remember, but it was like five years ago. It was an attack on a Christmas market in Germany. Yes, that's right. I don't think it was in the same place, but... Yeah, this guy was going to do the same thing. 17 years old. Uh, a Turk. And he is currently in prison. Unfortunately, the Germans are going to find there are many others who share his views. Okay, let's see. Meanwhile, we had... Uh, hang on, hang on. I was yeah. wrong. It was eight years ago. On December 19th, 2016, Islamist attacker Anas Amri drove a stolen truck through a crowd in central Berlin, killing and injuring dozens. It's a Christmas market in, this one was in Berlin. But they, uh... Robert, this goes back to what we're saying, like why they attack concerts and so on. It's okay. So you have, you have Muslims like Al-Qaeda, you know, Al-Qaeda and so on. They are perfectly happy attacking a target. Uh, and they're, they're totally, they're totally fine knowing that they may be killing Muslims as well because it's just collateral damage. Um, or if it's a Western, if it's a Western 
uh, Muslim. They don't care about killing Western Muslims at all because they're part of the system. They're funding, they're paying taxes and funding the U.S. government, which is so they're they're actually under Allah's punishment as well. Mm -hmm. But you do have terrorists who want to avoid killing actual Muslims at all costs. They don't even want to kill Muslims as collateral damage. What do you do then? Well, you target a place where you're not going to have any serious devout Muslims. So an Ariana Grande concert or a Christmas market playing Christmas music. You're going to be a devout Muslim walking around a Christmas market playing Christmas music? No. Good place for a terrorist attack. Indeed. Meanwhile, in Iraq, uh, I should have brought this up in connection with the earlier stories. We have yet another case of the mistreatment of young girls. The Iraqis are poised. The Iraqi parliament is about to lower the age of consent for marriage from 18 to 9. Huh, Where do you think that. they got that? No idea. One of life's great mysteries, Robert. <laughs> yes. Nobody by, knows by the, why. By the way, this is one of the ongoing serious, serious problems that's going to get significantly, it's about to get significantly worse. One of the reasons people in the West, is going back to what we were talking about earlier, one of the, one of the reasons people in the West look at other people in the world and say, oh, we all think the same, is that lots of nations have adopted similar laws and similar policies and done similar things over time. People don't realize that the Muslim world, this was kind of imposed on them. They were told, they were told, you need to abolish slavery. They were told, this is the 20th century. They were told, you guys have to, you guys have to make laws against slavery. Um, I mean, this was, this was John F. Kennedy when Saudi, uh, Saudi officials were showing up and they still had black slaves. And he said, "You can, we, whoa! You pump the brakes, pump the brakes. You, we can, we cannot, we cannot be having these, uh, these interactions and so on. If you have slaves, you need to do something. So that was they were made to do that. But it's the same thing with laws protecting little girls and so on from being married off to creepy old perverts. That sort of thing was imposed on Muslim nations, and as Muslim nations." Uh, realize that they can actually might be able to get away with this stuff now, or as they sense weakness from Western nations, and you're not going to stand up for what you what you're not going to stand up for these things like you did in the 20th century. It should try to bring them back, and so you're going to see that you're going to you're going to see places bringing back child marriage, slavery, and all these other things. Now they they always had this, the child marriage. Uh, it was just you know it was it would be an official law, but they would kind of look the other way if people are breaking the law. But uh, they do want to go back to an Islamic way of thinking. Yep. It's in interesting what you say. That fooled a lot of people. Uh, that they had the law that said one thing, but they would look the other way if somebody's doing something that's in accord with Sharia. Uh, th remember the case, this is like 20-some years ago now, of uh, Hussein Kambar Ali in Kuwait. And he was a Muslim who became a Christian. And... He was put on trial for apostasy. And he said in the Kuwaiti court, what are you doing putting me on trial for apostasy when the Kuwaiti constitution allows freedom of religion? And the judge said, the Kuwaiti constitution is under the Sharia and Sharia mandates the death for apostasy. And that's why you're on trial. Mm -hmm. And all that time he thought that uh, he was in a country that allowed for the freedom of conscience and he wasn't. Mm -hmm. but all Robert, right all, all yeah all countries believe in freedom of conscience <laughs> that's right they all want freedom that's what george mm -hmm. w bush told us uh we had an interesting court case this past week in britain you may have seen these guys uh there were 20 men who were found guilty and sentenced to 250 a total of 259 years in prison for their uh sexual abuse and rape of girls as young as 12. Now, you look at this picture, David, it, it's it's a funny thing because nobody in the British media seemed to have any idea of any unifying factor that tied all these guys together. Can you think of one? Um, I was about to say they're all bald, but they're not. That's just mainly the guys on top. Uh, I don't know. What could it be? It's a big mystery. 
Interestingly enough, I don't have it here, but there was another group of pictures because it's 20 men all together. And in the second group, there is a picture of one guy named Craig Mitchell. And I was looking at the British press talking about this and I, I couldn't believe it because I'd open story after story from the British press. Big picture of Craig Mitchell. And I mean, he's, he's one guy whose name is not Muhammad or Sawan or whatever, something that's a Muslim name. Malik. And he's the one who gets in the picture, that gets Smart. the big picture. And you see yeah, what that's the, how they do it. Yeah, this is what the British media is trying to do to cover up. I don't know what Craig Mitchell's story is, but he's either a convert to Islam or is somebody who was just joining in to this criminal activity because he was enjoying it for his own reasons. But uh, you have 19 Muslims involved in this. Now, we have talked about this before, but I know there's still people who don't realize it, and I know you're not even allowed to discuss it or notice the connection in Britain. So what is it, David, that may, makes it so common? Why does this keep happening that it's large groups of Muslim men who are involved in this kind of activity? Well, they are, uh, of course, allowed. They, they view even children as uh, potential sexual partners. That's, that's just for marriage and so on. But if you're talking about non-Muslims, they believe that you can take captives and sex slaves and so on. And they understand they're not in a position to go out and take them by conquering and so on. But they're kind of in a situation where, hey, if you're dumb enough to just let us take your daughters and stuff and dupe them into being our sex slaves, then we're, of course we're going to do that. And they do it. And you still have you still have uh, politicians and journalists who do who like have spent decades covering for them and trying to shield them from criticism. Surely this talking, must be forbidden in the Quran, right? I have no idea where. Uh, I mean, <laughs> non-Muslims are the worst of creatures. Muslims are the best of people. This is all built into the into the thinking as well. I mean, from an Islamic perspective, Muslims are superior to non-Muslims. Right? Muslims are the best of peoples ever raised up for mankind. Jews, Christians, polytheists, and so on are the worst of creatures. We're lower than cattle. We're lower than dogs. They're allowed to take us as, why are they allowed to take non-Muslims as sex slaves? It's, you're demonstrating your superiority over them. We'll just walk up and kill you and take your, take your girl, take your daughter, and go over here and bang her. There's nothing you could do about it. We're superior to you. That's how the world is supposed to be in Islam. But you have all these guys, and they're in a psychological crisis. This is the way that the world is supposed to be. We're the world is supposed to be us on top, everyone else completely subjugated to us. They look around, and it's Muslims who are backwards and coming to Western nations. Please, sir, may we have some more? Begging for handouts and stuff like that. It's pathetic, and it's really bothering them. Right? They're they're conflicted psychologically. There's the way the world is supposed to be, and the world is just not cooperating, and when they take a 12 year old girl and drug her rape her gang rape her and start pimping her it gives them that sense of domination that they crave we are we are showing you that we are superior to you in this situation so you have sick stuff you have a very sick way of thinking uh very disturbed psychology pretty straightforward pretty easy to understand but no one wants to deal with it Exactly. And if you do, if you actually say something about it, they'll declare war on you. Look what, look what they're still doing to Tommy Robinson. There you go. And that's with the, of course, the willing help of the British authorities, the non-Muslim British authorities. Anyway, uh, last week we spoke about the jizya being collected in Mali. And this week I have a story about the jizya being collected in Bangladesh, uh, where... Muslims asked Hindus to uh, pay jizya as well as to remain silent during the times of Islamic prayer. And this, of course, is just another assertion of hegemony and the subjugation of the infidels as the Quran directs. Is and this, this all this all ties this all ties together, right? So this is the way the, the world is supposed to be. Muslims controlling the non-Muslims. And they'll do that whenever possible. In the 20th century, after the collapse of the uh, Ottoman Empire, the, the loss of their caliphate, the, them viewing and seeing the clear superiority of Western nations, they adapted, not because they thought that, not because they, they 
they thought it was a great idea, but just out of, I mean, you, you did have some who thought, okay, Islam lost and so on. We need to become more Western and stuff and to move forward and stuff. Uh, but other people were doing it uh, like temporarily, temporarily. Okay, we'll, we'll go along with you uh, until the Muslim world is strong enough to go back to Sharia. And that's what we see. That's what you see with uh, Iraq saying, hey, we can dial back, um, you know, the age to nine so that men can marry nine year olds. And you have places, OK, we're getting back to Jizya. We're getting back to and they're just they're trying to bring it back. They 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 sent one. They, they kind of sense weakness. Um, but two, it's kind of a last ditch effort as well. It's a similar idea to that of ISIS. Maybe the reason that we're so weak is that we're not cracking down enough and we're not imposing Sharia. Uh, and so you have this you have this uh, mentality of we need to do this. We need to impose Sharia. We need to be more devout and more strict in imposing Sharia because maybe that's why Allah is giving us so many losses to everyone. Okay, so you were talking about countries feeling strong enough to go back to Sharia. It's just what's happening in Libya, where Libya is introducing morality police to enforce modesty, clamp down on strange haircuts. So don't go to Libya, David. And girls from the age of nine will have to wear veils. Where did they get the nine? Where does that come I from? I have no idea. Like maybe because cats have cats have nine lives. Uh, I don't know. Women will be forbidden from traveling without a male companion or sitting inappropriately with men in public. And what's interesting is what they say to complainers. Ahmad Atrabelsi, who is the interior minister of the Libyan government of national unity. Listen to what he says here. Personal freedom does not exist here in Libya. Those seeking it should go to Europe. Hmm. Hmm. And conquer them. Yes. Impose and Sharia it, there. What's ironic is exactly the people. Okay, so now the people who want personal freedom are going to go from Libya into Italy, and then they'll put Sharia in Italy. And so there won't be personal freedom there. Where will the people who want personal freedom go after Europe? That remains unclear. Indeed. By the way, Robert, this is also connected to everything we're talking about before as far as uh, uh, people in the West thinking that everyone wants the same things that they want and has the same values. You remember the Arab Spring, Robert? Because that's oh, yeah. that was that was part of... Libya. You had the Arab Spring. You had you had this idea even before that with Saddam and so on. You had the idea from the perspective of the West. You have all these peaceful, wonderful Muslims who just want freedom and democracy, but they're under the control of evil dictators and tyrants, people like Saddam Hussein, Assad, Gaddafi. All these guys are keeping freedom from blossoming. And so we have the mentality in the West, because it's what worked for the United States, just shake off the tyrant, get rid of the tyrant, and then things, things will go well. Then you can have freedom and democracy. It's what we did in the US. And we think, ah, it worked here. Why can't it work in Iraq? Well, maybe because you had a different kind of population uh, here than you did in Iraq. So what do we do? We get rid of Saddam and oh, they're, now they're blowing up each other's mosque. And oh, now we're getting ISIS. We don't know what's going on. Maybe they don't think like you, you giant morons. And they were just using you and your gullible, stupid ideas to get rid of the guy who was keeping them in check. In other words, you already had the terrorists there. They already wanted to start blowing up each other's mosques. They already wanted to fight. They already wanted to go into killings, but they already wanted something ISIS-like. They couldn't because Saddam would have tanks rolling into their town and killing everyone. So they couldn't do it. But hey, Western nations, we want freedom. We want democracy. Can you take out this tyrant? Oh, sure. You're going to do that for us? Great. Now ISIS forms. They tried the same thing. They tried the same thing in Syria, but uh, wanted, people wanted to get rid of Gaddafi, got rid of it. And now we're going to have freedom and democracy. Nope. Now you got the morality police marching through the streets. Yep. Ah, in Egypt, right next door, three Christian men were hospitalized after suffering multiple stab wounds. They went to the pharmacy. And inside the pharmacy, there were four Muslims who attacked them with knives and machetes. 
And it reminded me, David, of uh, talking to an Egyptian woman some years ago. And she said, every day you go out, you never know what might happen. And you can be walking down the street and be attacked, kidnapped, raped, sold into slavery. You just don't know. It can happen any time. And I think these poor guys, they went to the pharmacy. Who knows, you know, get the prescription filled or whatever. And they end up getting stabbed and they're in the hospital. And that is the precarious existence of the non-Muslim in a majority Muslim country. Mm -hmm. And now they want to make uh, all of Europe and all the world like that. Great. What could go wrong? Yeah, it's going to be wonderful. We should, we should all help them. <laughs> yeah, because otherwise you'd be an Islamophobe and that would be bad. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you don't want to be called a name. It's better to you know have your daughters raped. and anyway. Yeah, so that's where it stands, ladies and gentlemen. There's plenty more jihad for the full details go see jihadwatch.org and uh please leave a donation there on the sidebar hit us up on patreon we uh need your help to keep going at this point and we will keep going god willing and be here next week god willing and until then don't be afraid to go to the pharmacy and pray hope and don't worry <laughs>